I want to start off um, this morning. I want to use some data to talk about what's happening in Gippsland in um, training and in the general sort of economic space where our industries work. It's an area I'm interested in not only from my past and present jobs, but also because I sit on the uh, Gippsland Regional Partnership, which is really uh, it's a useful platform, I think, for Gippsland to have a direct line into government. So we get to help plan where government will spend on infrastructure in the short term, so this year's budget, and in the longer term, so planning for what the region needs. So we get a really good sense of it. The framework I use to think about industries comes from the Australian New Zealand industry codes. They're the standard industry codes we use. They're called ANZIC codes. And they generally have a pretty good way of breaking the world up in thinking about industries, but not always. So my favourite area to think about where it doesn't make sense is other services because automotive and hairdressing go together in ANZIC codes. And I can't think of anywhere else where that would happen, certainly not in a teaching sphere. We'd never think of putting them together. But in ANZIC we do. And that's why you're in the services area. And I've pulled education out and got an education group here. The other thing that has a standard coding uh, is there's a standard list of jobs and occupations which we won't look too much at today, but just if you ever come across um, the jobs classifications, the Australian New Zealand jobs classifications, that's what the Australian Bureau of Statistics actually lumps you all into if you filled out your census form before the computers went down or on paper after they went down last year. Um, that's the listing that the Australian Bureau of Statistics would look at to say, yes, you're in this type of, of job or, or another type. I'm really not interested in the numbers for the data that I show you today. What I want you to look at are patterns. Patterns of where things are trending upwards or downwards or going up and down. Because the numbers are really pretty meaningless. They're usually just a snapshot in time. And some of the data that I'm looking at today is getting incredibly old. In fact, it will expire in a fortnight. So the census is done every five years. The last census was in 2011, and some of the data that we have is still relates to the last census. Census data, once you've done the census in September, which we did last year, it takes a good six months before the data is analysed and released, and the first batches are due out at the end of June. So the actual numbers of what I say will all be turned on their heads within a little while, but the trends still tend to remain the same. So I just want you to keep that in mind. There's no test around the, the numbers or the data today. You've also got, apart from the presentation we'll do, you've also got a handout, uh, you should have two. One's a coloured bit that's got the questions and things I want you to look at today. The second one is sort of, um, it's got education department and a map of Gippsland on the front. Can you see that? It's got quite a good summary of what is happening in the training area and I want you to use that as a resource later this morning. That's got more gritty data than what I'll be talking about. So to start off, Gippsland. It's the largest regional area in Victoria by a long shot. Geographically, we are huge compared to any other single area in the state. We have a comparatively small population and of that population, 27%, so just under a third or just over a quarter, live in the Latrobe um, City Shire. There are six shires in Gippsland and they span from Bass Coast, um, Phillip Island, up into the mountains around Omeo and right to the point to the border at Malakuta. So geographically it's huge and Federation Training is the only private provider that is, oh, sorry, 
I've got that really backwards. The only public provider um, that is based within this large region. If you think of any other areas like Ballarat or you know where there's a, a TAFE, they're servicing a much more contained area and a population that's pulled together much more. Our dispersed population means not that we don't have population around our areas that are outside, just that we have a lot of very small communities scattered the whole breadth of the region. And that poses particular problems for the train of, of any of, of where people live and how they move around. We have a growth forecast that's quite small, it's less than 1%. But there are some things that are happening, that, that is one of the older statistics. Um, there are some things that are happening that make that a very fluid sort of statistic. Um, if any of you heard the news this morning, the government is talking about encouraging people to move to regional areas to take the pressure off Melbourne. And you would know, you, you can't watch the news at night without seeing that mortgages are getting higher, jobs are getting harder, but the Monash Freeway will be chock-a-block full the moment they finish those roadworks because it will have taken so long and it will just catch up again. So the pressure on infrastructure and housing costs and livability in Melbourne is unsustainable. So the government wants to offer incentives to encourage people to move into regions. What we're likely to see though is that the move won't be even. It will start at the borders where it's closer, so around the Pakenham area, and then it gradually moves east. So we know that that's not data we can necessarily rely on. But we're not looking at <coughs> having a population explosion anytime soon. Like everywhere in Australia, but particularly here, we have um, an older population that's growing faster than our young population. So the whole population is increasing, but people who are over 70 years of age are increasing as a higher proportion of our overall population than any other group. We're not only getting older, there are more of us getting older. And that means a lot of things for the workforce and for training as well. For the workforce, we hear the government talking about asking people to work longer. And often that's associated with changing careers and working longer. So there are implications for training if we have more people staying in the workforce for a longer period of time, changing careers. It also has implications for how we get younger people into the workforce. Because the older people are staying, jobs for younger people only <coughs> occur if, if either of, or a combination of two things happen. One is if the economy grows and there are more jobs, so you can put them in. Or second, if the younger people start picking up jobs that are what we're now calling part of a gig economy. It sounds like a rock concert, so you do a gig, you're there for the night and you drop back out again. And that type of work is very precarious for them. It's part-time, it's casualised, and we're seeing a lot more younger people taking up a lot more casual positions across all industry sectors. Again, there are training implications for that. They have to be really good at selling themselves constantly, at going for job opportunities constantly, at keeping their skills refreshed constantly because the competition for casual work is much harder and faster than it is once you're in a job that's full time and you have any type of, of tenure or security. So something for us to look at. Our 20 to 49 age group is relatively smaller as a percentage of our overall population than uh, it is across the rest of the state. That makes sense if you think about we have more people who are over 70. It feeds that cycle of we're not growing a workforce with younger people to necessarily look after older people. So there are implications around um, aged care and community support services. And there are also implications for things that keep the government awake at night. We don't have a lot of younger people coming through paying taxes. 
to help help us provide the services that we want. Um, our 50 plus age group just sits leading up to, we're, you know, anyone who's over 50 that's in this room, I won't ask how many, but we're all contributing nicely towards that over 70 end point. Are there any surprises in that? Do you notice that when you walk around the shops or the community? Do you walk around the streets saying, gee, it's full of young people? We've got so many young families moving into the area, it's fantastic. Would you walk around and say, yep, people like us, like me? I live on Raymond Island near Bairnsdale and was absolutely devastated when I moved there seven years ago to find out I was about the second youngest person on the island. It was a bit of a challenge. They call it God's waiting room. When they don't call it Alcatraz. Okay, our income. The average total income in 2013 was around $47,000, which is quite a bit under the average income for the state. There's a problem with this data in itself in that most of the um, higher wages that you see in Victorian data is skewed towards Melbourne because that's where most of the bankers, stockbrokers, lawyers, accountants, live you know so they cluster and that pushes Melbourne up drops us back a bit but it's still a fairly low percentage um, in Gippsland people who live <coughs> in the Trobe Shire just one of the six are likely to have an income that's quite a bit higher than any of the other shires there's an implication for training in that where you've got the bulk of your population sitting who potentially might be able to afford fee for service or mightn't have to grapple with things like paying for transport, paying to drive, you know, up and down the highway, um, then, then well, I'll reverse the, the analogy. If you're paying to drive up and down the highway and you're earning a lot less, you may not actually think about wanting to pay for extra things, for example, training. So there's an implication for us in how do you think about training delivery for people where an income level is fairly low? What are your options for full fee for service training into an industry where people and you know, small businesses may not be able to afford as much as if they were in the Trobe City? There aren't any great answers to any of these questions. They're just things to sort of think about and work with. There's an index of, and I know you can't read the um, titles here, but what you can see is where colours in the blue get darker. And you can also see, oh, I think you can see my mouse, you can see Gippsland sits sort of in the middle here. Um, there's an index of relative socioeconomic disadvantage that's put out annually, and it looks at a mixture of measures for families such as um, how many single parent families there are, where there are poor English skills, whether there's internet connectivity, how many people live in overcrowded dwellings. Um, think about the Grenville Tower in London. 120 apartments were in that tower block and 600 people. That's more than four in each small apartment. So it's that kind of metric, um, joblessness and low income. They put it together and they look at how different areas across the state fare against those measures. The palest areas are the pale blue and when you think about it, the further you move from Melbourne, coming across here, the further you move, the higher or the darker the colour, the higher the level of disadvantage against those measures. So again, there are things about thinking about equity, thinking about how you reach people who are living further from Melbourne in, in areas where perhaps they can't afford everything. They're not necessarily going to have the fastest internet speeds. They're not necessarily going to have the highest tech um, computers and smartphones. They're not necessarily going to have 
limitless download accounts. So perhaps the, the thought of doing um, full video conferencing for every class, for every time you deliver, may not work. So distance plays a part in, in looking at how you reach people who are disadvantaged. There are two wellbeing indexes. I just wanted to, again, pick out shapes. This top one is a community wellbeing index and it starts, it looks at each of the regions across Victoria and the higher the score, the better off you are. The community wellbeing index is one where the community is surveyed each year and it's asked, do you think your community is a great place to live? Does your community cope well with change? Now we've got a couple of really big issues happening around the region at the moment that perhaps we would have communities that wouldn't feel that their community is, is doing well with change. Um, does your community face challenges well? Does it have a bright future? Is there a good community spirit? Is this a community in which you are proud to live? Now, I know you can't read all of these from, I'm presuming from the back of the room, but you can see the orange, can't you? And so if I said that Loddon Campaspe is the best and Goulburn is the worst, oh, sorry, Gippsland's sitting <coughs> right here on the edge. This is Gippsland. So perhaps our communities aren't as resilient as we would like them to see. They're not managing as well as change. What does that mean for training? If you're trying to talk about new industries, new jobs, new challenges, you've got quite a bit of marketing and sales work to do to bring people along with you. The second index <clears throat> is a community economic wellbeing index. And it's one that says, you know, um, do you think your community, again, it's based on a survey, do you think your community is somewhere where people are well off? It doesn't necessarily mean are you earning $300,000 a year, but do you feel well off within your community? Are your living costs affordable? Now we know the cost of living is generally lower here than it is in Melbourne. Are there plenty of local jobs? Do you think local businesses in your town are doing well? So how's the community going? And again, Loggan Campaspe comes out tops. Goulburn is at the bottom. But this time, Gippsland has dropped further. We're definitely into the negative territory here. So we're feeling okay from a community point of view, but when we look at our community economics, and that's particularly around local business, we're not so confident. 